Hi, hello, I am the Cyber Reef Guru. Thank you so much for watching. A few weeks ago, some lovely people from Saint Smart reached out to me and asked if I would be interested in evaluating the Jimitsu CNC machine. I jumped at the offer and waited patiently for my machine to arrive. It arrived about a week later, but I was in the middle of a different project, so I set the machine aside until I was ready to fully evaluate it. Well, that time has come and I bring you a fairly in-depth review of the machine. I will start by covering the specifications of the machine, then show you the build process, then show you some of the testing that I did. In the end, I will wrap up the video with my thoughts and my recommendations. The Jimitsu 3018 Pro Ver V2, that is one heck of a name, comes with a bevy of features that you don't normally find with a machine at this price point. The cutting area is 290 millimeters by 180 millimeters by 40 millimeters, or approximately 11.4 inches by 7.1 inches by 1.6 inches. The machine comes mostly assembled and is made out of aluminum, acrylic, and select plastic parts. The machine is controlled by a 32-bit processor running Gerbil, which makes it super compatible with a wide range of CAM and controller software. It has a 42mm, 24-volt spindle capable of 9,000 RPMs that is controlled via G-code and includes an ER14 collet, which is perfect for 1 8 inch end mills. Other features include a Z-probe, which is a little unusual at this low price point, limit switch, which is a nice touch, an e-stop button, and some engraving bits. My machine came with 20 degree engraving bits, but you can purchase other bits from Saint Smart or other vendors. They also included an external controller that allows you to use your machine without being tethered to a computer, which is quite nice. And once again, a little unusual at this price point. Speaking of price, the machine lists for $349 US, but you can pick one up from Amazon for about $269 as of July 2023. You can also get a variety of parts and upgrades for the machine from Saint Smart directly. I will leave links to all the parts that I use in this video in case you want to pick some of them up. Now that we've covered the specifications, let's talk about the build process. It took me about 30 minutes to put the entire thing together, and I certainly wasn't hurrying in any way. The base is fully assembled, as is the Z gantry, which is really nice. Only eight screws, and you have the machine almost entirely assembled. The most complicated part of the build was getting the side panels on. It can be a little bit tricky getting all four T-nuts aligned at the same time, but with a little bit of patience, it won't take long. After all the mechanicals are put together, you just need to plug in the motors to the control board, and you're off to the races. With the build complete, I turned my attention to the software. The recommended software for controlling the machine is Windows only, so that solution is off the table for me. Fortunately, the controller is based on Gerbil, which I have a long history with, and I can use one of my favorite control software, Universal G-Code Center. I've been using UGS for about 15 years now. It was my daily driver for my Shape Oco and my X-Carve, all the way until I got my Onefinity. It's really great to see the software still being developed and has come a really long way since I last used it. I'm very impressed with its features and capabilities now and I highly recommend you check it out. Links in the description. I plugged the machine into the computer, turned it on, and UGS immediately recognized it. I did some quick testing by jogging the machine around and then I homed it. Everything worked smoothly so I jumped over to Fusion 360 and whipped up some tests. To dial in my settings, I created a couple different tests at different speeds to see how the machine reacts and to see if I could find a sweet spot. My very first test produced some very interesting results. I tested a pocket operation at 20, 30, and 40 inches per minute. The machine finished all the operations without any problem, but the results were not very good. In fact, the results for the 30 and 40 inch per minute tests were completely unacceptable. Both tests showed some level of deflection and neither one of them were perfectly square. Now the 30 inch per minute test was better than the 40, but neither one of them were acceptable. There was visible chatter on the sides of both of the pockets. The 20 inch per minute pocket turned out better with only minor chatter on the sides. 
From there, I expanded my testing to include 10, 15, and 20 inches per minute, as well as both climb and conventional cutting. If you're not familiar with climb and conventional cutting, there are plenty of great resources out on the internet. In short, however, climb cutting is where the bit shears off material as it moves through. The chips start at maximum thickness and then decrease to zero, placing max stress on the bit initially. Conventional milling is the opposite. The chip starts at zero thickness and then increases to max thickness at the end. This places the least stress on the bit initially and then works up to max stress. In this case, the tool rubs more than it shears, and so this does increase tool wear and then ultimately decrease the working life of the end mill. However, since conventional milling does produce less stress, I was hoping that I could get higher feed rates with the conventional over the climb milling. After a number of tests, the conventional milling cuts were a little bit better and a little bit more accurate, but there was not a tremendous difference between the two. Probably with this machine, I would recommend using conventional milling over climb milling because it does produce less stress, and you'll just have to deal with a little bit of extra tool wear over time. After doing the test cuts, I did notice that some of the pieces were not the sizes that I intended, and so I set out to test the machine's movements and repeatability. Out of the box, the machine moved exactly how far it was commanded to do and returned to the same position each time. It appears there's very little backlash in the mechanics, and the machine is tuned properly straight from the factory. Since the motion mechanics seemed to be spot on, yet there were still some inaccuracies, I checked the run out of the spindle. I checked both the rotor and the bit as well. The results were essentially identical with about two thousandths run out at speed. This is well within respectable limits and nothing to be concerned about for a machine at this price point. It is worth noting that I did not use a dial indicator to test run out, which is the preferred tool, so more accurate testing might be warranted in the future. In the end, I was not able to figure out why none of my parts were the exact correct size. I was consistently getting pockets that were about 0.2 to 0.4 millimeters too big, and contours that were too small by about the same amount. I had the same issue with my original Shape Oco, and I found switching the conventional milling for the pockets improved my results. In this case, the improvements were not so dramatic. Now the good news is that the offsets seem to be consistent, so you can compensate for this by adding or subtracting a little from your model or during the milling process. Using something like stock to leave and doing a light finishing pass will certainly improve your results. Now that we covered all the testing that I did, let's discuss my thoughts and provide some recommendations. First, for the price, this machine is a serious bargain. My original Shape Oco was over twice as much, and it took me almost three days to put together. Plus, it had massive repeatability problems. By that metric, the Jumitsu is a better choice, hands down. Secondarily, this machine offers features that were unheard of when I started working with CNC's. The offline controller is very nice, and having a Z-probe is killer for decreasing your downtime between jobs. All that said, the accuracy issues I experienced are a major downer. Given the quality of the machine and all the features, I don't know why it is not more accurate. I tested everything that I could think of, and I was just not able to dial it in. For some people, that half a millimeter might break their project. Certainly, if you do a lot of inlays, accuracy will be a major stumbling block for this machine. Secondarily, certain areas of the manual could be improved. For example, there are no instructions on how to connect that offline controller or the Z-probe. Now, after looking at the controller, it was obvious where they needed to be attached, but a beginner might not be so adventurous, so a little beefing up of the manual might be warranted. Nevertheless, you can't beat this machine in terms of price versus features, and it makes the perfect entry-level machine for anyone who wants to learn how to use a CNC, engrave items, and do some light milling. I really don't think it can be beat. If you are new to CNC and you want to learn how to use CAD and CAM software for a machine like this, well then check out this video right here. Thank you so much for watching, thank you so much for getting this far, and don't forget, to be inspired.